Thank you, Lonnie, for that uh, wonderful, warm introduction. And I think on those give and take cards, we should all give Lonnie uh, a, um, a, a wonderful round of uh, gratitude for her extraordinary giving. The, the series that she has put together for this community, uh, I know many of these people, uh, you guys are just extraordinarily fortunate. So uh, uh, I'm uh, very deeply grateful and honored to be part of this illustrious group of uh, people who have come through this community. Uh, what I'd like to do this evening is to tell you a little bit about our work uh, and convey some of the implications of that work for education as well as other related areas. Uh, I'd like to begin by first giving you a brief kind of autobiographical interlude. Uh, I'm a psychologist and a neuroscientist by training. And I had the great fortune early in my career to be around a number of people whose demeanor and whose presence seemed to be unusual. These were just extraordinarily warm-hearted people. They're the kind of people I really wanted to spend more time around. Uh, and um, uh, uh, they were uh, very nourishing. They were not, by and large, the people in the academy. They were not my professors at Harvard. Uh, they were people that I managed to find outside the academy. Uh, and uh, I learned that they all had in common an interest in and a practice of meditation. And that first kindled my interest in this area. I then wanted to do research in this area. Uh, and uh, I went off, actually, to India for the first time when I was a graduate student in 1974 to uh, get a, a taste of what these practices might be from a first-person perspective. Uh, and I spent three months in India and in Sri Lanka. And I came back with a real fervent aspiration to do rigorous research uh, on these techniques, which I'll tell you more about as we go along tonight. But it was made very clear to me that this was not uh, a very productive way to begin my scientific career. Uh, my professors were quite explicit in telling me, Richie, if you want a successful career in science, don't begin in this way. Uh, and uh, what that led to is me becoming, for about 20 years, a closet meditator. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, I've come out of the closet. Uh, and uh, that is, in part, why I'm here this evening. Uh, and so I pursued a career on the brain and emotion, which is still a career that envelops all of what we do. And it is um, a career and a focus uh, that we're still intensely passionate about. I began with a central question early on in my career. And that question still motivates much of what we do. And the question is a very simple one. Why are certain people resilient in the face of adversity and other individuals vulnerable? Why is it that some people, in response to life's slings and arrows, are able to cope with that adversity in a way which is skillful, in a way which does not lead to significant problems, and others, when they encounter adversity, or even when they encounter the minor common hassles of everyday life, uh, begin to become distressed and have that distress persist for quite a long period of time, and in certain cases, to the extent uh, of persisting into and culminating in uh, disorders that can be debilitating. So what accounts for those variations among people? This was a question that uh, was central to early work that I did. And it's a question that I've pursued for my entire career. And it's a question 
that we're still intensely focused on. And the book, uh, The Emotional Life of Your Brain, that I wrote is a summary of 30 years of research where we have looked at the neuroscientific um, bases, the, the neural mechanisms in the brain that underlie variations among people in how they respond to emotionally challenging events. Now, the work on meditation uh, fits into all of this because meditation represents a family of practices in which we all can engage that can actually help us to alter our emotional styles. It can help us transform the differences among us to nudge people in a more positive and healthy direction, to help cultivate resilience uh, and to um, minimize vulnerability in response to these kinds of challenges. Uh, and uh, the trajectory of my career changed dramatically and what uh, enabled me really to come out of the closet was uh, a very significant meeting that I had in 1992. Uh, in that year, in the fall of that year, I was invited for the first time to meet with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama learned about uh, the work that, is this microphone still? Can people hear me in the back? Not as well. Okay, I wonder, um, okay, that's better. Okay, thank you. Um, so in that year, in 1992, in the fall of 1992, I went off to India uh, to meet with the Dalai Lama. He learned about the work that I was doing uh, from some mutual friends, and he was interested in promoting serious neuroscientific research on Tibetan uh, practitioners who have spent years training their mind. And he was very curious to learn if the years of intensive training actually produced changes that Western neuroscientists can measure in their brain. And so he invited me to meet with him. Uh, and that meeting was a very pivotal meeting. In addition to discussing the details of what such research might look like, he also challenged me and he said, look, you've used the tools of modern neuroscience to study qualities like fear and anxiety and depression. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And there really wasn't a good answer other than that it's hard. But you know, when we began to study fear and anxiety, that was hard too. And scientists have made a good deal of progress in understanding the neural bases of qualities like fear and anxiety. And there's no reason in principle why we can't make similar progress in understanding kindness and compassion. If you go back to textbooks of psychology in the mid-1990s, you won't find, amazingly, the word compassion in the index. And that is, in my view, at this point in time, nothing short of scandalous. But that is the reality of the history of this discipline. And um, I made a commitment to the Dalai Lama on that day in 1992 that I was going to do everything I could to put compassion and kindness in the crosshairs of scientific inquiry and to do everything I could to make the study of those qualities part of mainstream science. And, and that's something that I've been trying to do since that meeting. Uh, and it took us a number of years to ramp up, but um, we began a very unusual study, which I'll tell you about, uh, in about 1999. Uh, and that study involved flying to Madison, Wisconsin, uh, individuals who were expert practitioners in meditation. And we had a fantastic person who was helping us recruit these participants. Uh, and that person was none other than the Dalai Lama himself. Uh, and so he helped us identify specific individuals, most of whom were living in either India or Nepal. 
uh, and we flew them to Madison, Wisconsin to spend several days in residence in our laboratory. And I want to start by showing you some photographs and um, uh, some of the uh, results of that work. So if we can go to the slides. So and this is a picture of the Dalai Lama when he first came to our lab. Uh, this was taken in 2001. And by the way, he will be visiting us again in a few weeks um, in a program sponsored by our center. He will be in Madison uh, with us on May 15th. Uh, and uh, there still might be a few tickets available. If any of you are interested, and if you can't get there in person, it will be live web streamed. So uh, please go to our website, investigatinghealthyminds.org, and you can tune into the proceedings free um, and live on May 15th this year. So this is His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who is um, visiting us uh, at the Wasteman Center um, uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, at the university, and we're showing him an MRI scanner, and um, he is someone who is just intensely curious about the interstices of how science is conducted. And um, in this particular uh, case, on this day, I had one of my students dutifully lying in the scanner, waiting for the moment when, whoops, uh, for the moment when we walked in with His Holiness. Uh, and I told my student, David, just lie there, we'll be there eventually. And um, uh, so he was just in the scanner for a couple of hours, and um, he's a meditator, so that was he, just fine. Um, and what we decided to do is to do something very simple that uh, illustrates how we can look at the functional activity of the brain using MRI. This is a very, very simple kind of task that always works, and we thought we would use this to show the Dalai Lama. And so we simply had David move the fingers on his right hand. When you move the fingers on your right hand, the motor cortex in the left side of the brain is activated. And you can see that with the naked eye on the images that come up on the monitor. So we had David move his fingers, and you can see um, his fingers lying outside the tube of the scanner. There's a, um, a, a, um, a window pane to look into the scanner room. So the Dalai Lama was able to see David moving the, the fingers of his right hand. And sure enough, we saw the motor cortex in his left hemisphere become activated, and similarly moving his left fingers, the right hemisphere becomes activated. Um, so we did this, and as soon as we did that, His Holiness said, can I please ask him to do something? So we, we said, of course. Uh, and so the Dalai Lama asked him, would you please imagine that the fingers on your right hand are moving, but don't actually move them. Just imagine that they're moving. Uh, and he wanted to see if there is activity in the brain that occurs with pure mental activity. That is, no actual behavior is being expressed. It's all going on inside one's head, so to speak. Um, and so we did this. And of course, the Dalai Lama is amazing. He's like your dream graduate student. Um, uh, uh, and he sometimes kids us and says that in his retirement, maybe he'll come take a sabbatical, uh, um, which, uh, needless to say, uh, we would certainly um, be totally thrilled about not expecting it to happen. He has other commitments. But um, he is extraordinary in his, uh, uh, in his insights. These experiments involving mental imagery have been done to some extent previously. And uh, so we asked David to imagine, to do exactly what the Dalai Lama requested. And you can then, you saw that his fingers were not actually moving. <clears throat> and yet, many of the same areas of the brain that we saw active when he was actually moving his fingers were active when he was imagining that his fingers were moving. 
that was a very uh, special moment for the Dalai Lama because he saw that pure mental activity can actually be expressed in the brain uh, and that these are powerful tools which can be used to measure the changes in mental activity that may be produced through practices <coughs> that are designed to transform the mind. And um, uh, so this was a, a, a significant day and I think it really helped to catalyze the Dalai Lama's interest in neuroscience. Uh, and uh, the Dalai Lama has spent more time with scientists than any political leader on the face of this planet and I think probably more time with scientists than any um, political or uh, religious figure has ever spent with scientists ever in the history of the planet. Um, he has extensive meetings with scientists and he said in a recent book that he wrote on, the, on science and spirituality, a book called the universe in a single atom, he says in the first chapter, if any tenant in Buddhism is directly contradicted by scientific fact, he is prepared to give that up. Um, a very unusual statement for uh, someone coming from uh, a religious tradition. So um, we in this program of research decided to take up the Dalai Lama's mandate and study compassion. And uh, we began by bringing these expert practitioners into the laboratory who engage in mental practices that are designed to strengthen compassion. And a little later in th this evening or this afternoon in this talk, I'll go through a practice that is commonly offered um, so you'll have a more granular feel for what it is. Now I'll just, um, the, the expert practitioners do something a little differently than what I think most of us would do uh, if we're doing something like this. But in the words of um, uh, one of the practitioners, this is what they were doing. He said, for the sake of the experiment, uh, what we'd like to do, what we've tried to do, is to generate a state in which love and compassion permeate the whole mind with no other consideration, reasoning, or discursive thoughts. Uh, now, you know, sometimes there are those commercials on television where it says in fine print, don't try this at home. Uh, well, I would encourage you, please do try this at home, but don't be discouraged if you're not able to do this in quite this way, that is, uh, if um, you find that there are discursive thoughts, distractions, intrusions, which occur, uh, and uh, you're not able to do this in a, in a clear, focused way. One of the virtues of working with these long-term practitioners is that at least by their report, they're really able to stay with this kind of practice even in the strange environment of lying in an MRI scanner or having a bunch of electrodes on their head while we're measuring their brain electrical activity. I should say that each of these long-term practitioners had a minimum of 10,000 hours of practice. Now, 10,000 hours may sound like a big number. It's actually a modest number, it's, it is, and it's not a number that we chose out of a hat. 10,000 hours is the minimum amount of time that a human being needs to develop expertise in any complex domain. 10,000 hours is what is required to be at an entry level of a professional musician. 10,000 hours is what is required to be at an entry level of a competitive chess player. 10,000 hours is about what's required to be at an elite level of a collegiate athlete. 10,000 hours is what is required in terms of practice to get to the entry level of expert performance. In our study, the long-term practitioners had an average of 34,000 hours of practice. So you can go do the arithmetic at home, 34,000 hours is a big number, 
Um, and uh, these are individuals who, in many ways, we can think of as the Olympic athletes of these sort of traditions. And they report that they're able to, to do this sort of thing where they can fill their mind in this way uh, in, in a completely undistracted fashion. So uh, these are a couple of pictures of um, these long-term practitioners. Uh, this is uh, someone who uh, is quite a famous um, uh, meditation master. He's published a number of popular books. His name is Mingyur Rinpoche. He's published a book called The Joy of Living uh, and another book called Joyful Wisdom. Uh, and uh, he's shown here in our laboratory uh, while we're recording brain electrical signals. Um, and uh, one of the things that we saw when we recorded these brain electrical signals for the first time is something very unusual. This is actually a figure from the first paper that we published based on this work with long-term practitioners. This paper was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and I simply mention that because this is a very old, more than 100-year-old, and very prestigious scientific journal. Uh, it is the first time, when we published this paper, the first time that a, a paper had ever been published in this journal on meditation. Uh, I'm very pleased to report that since this article appeared, there now have been a number of papers, uh, maybe six or seven, uh, and not all from our group, uh, which is great. Uh, and it underscores the fact that this is now becoming a, a legitimate area of mainstream scientific inquiry. Let me say what's going on in this slide. What you see on the left is the brain electrical signals during a, a resting state when participants are not doing anything special. And then what you see is a period during a meditation state, and they're practicing the meditation practice that I just described to you, where their minds are being filled with love and compassion. Um, and we see a very unusual change that you don't need fancy instrumentation to notice. You can see this with the naked eye. Uh, you can see that there is a clear transition in those uh, oscillations at the top part of the figure. And what is represented in these oscillations is what we call gamma uh, frequency oscillations. Gamma oscillations are oscillations that occur at about 40 cycles per second. And uh, these are fast frequency oscillations. Uh, they occur in a normal brain, but they typically occur for very, very short periods of time on the order of one second or less. And what they, they occur during states of focused attention. They also occur during periods when different elements of a percept are bound together. So when we have a perception, for example, if we see a red apple, uh, we, um, when we see that apple, uh, we're seeing the color of the apple, we're seeing the shape. We might have a gustatory representation that represents the taste. We may have an olfactory representation that <coughs> represents the typical smell of an apple. When all that stuff comes together uh, in a single percept, uh, we often see a burst of gamma oscillations, which represent the binding of those different elements together into a unified perception. What we see in these long-term practitioners is the display of these gamma oscillations for seconds and minutes and tens of minutes. Um, this is something that has ne had never, up until this point, been seen in the human brain before. We did not know that these gamma oscillations can unfold over time in this kind of way. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was something quite unusual. Uh, and uh, the significance of this is still something that we are actively pursuing. But these gamma oscillations clearly are related to attention. They're also, from basic neuroscience research, we know to be involved in mechanisms of synaptic plasticity, basic mechanisms of learning. And it may exemplify the state of heightened plasticity that may be present in the brains 
of these long-term practitioners. Uh, so this is the MRI scanner, and um, this is one of the other practitioners that we've studied, and the quote that I showed you earlier describing what the practitioners were doing when they were in the scanner was authored by this gentleman, and um, he's quite an extraordinary person. Uh, and he is someone that actually has been um, central to the success of this research. His name is Mathieu Ricard. Uh, he is French, obviously, by nationality. He's been a Tibetan Buddhist monk since 1967. He also has a PhD in molecular biology, uh, which he received from the Pasteur Institute, where he worked with Francois Jacob, who is a Nobel laureate. Um, he comes to the table with remarkable and unusual credentials. I don't think there's another person on the planet quite like him. Um, he also is a professional photographer. He's published uh, a number of books of photography uh, from the Himalayan region. And uh, uh, he thought he was leaving science when he became a Buddhist monk. Um, he, didn't, uh, he never imagined that he would return to science. Uh, that 2004 paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences was co-authored by Mathieu Ricard, and in part, that paper was about Mathieu's brain. Uh, and so uh, it's quite uh, an interesting uh, turn of events, and he now finds himself uh, enmeshed in a number of collaborations, and he's been to our laboratory many, many, many times, probably 15 times, uh, over the last 10 years, and uh, the Dalai Lama loves to refer to him as his favorite guinea pig. Uh, Mathieu is willing to try anything on behalf of uh, advancing this science. Um, so he has been really key, and in this particular picture, this was taken after Mathieu had been in the MRI scanner for more than three hours. Most people don't look like this after three hours when they come out. Um, this is a picture of Mingyur Rinpoche uh, in the scanner. Now, let me just very briefly tell you about some of the cool findings that we see in these people's brains when we examine them in the MRI scanner. We have been interested in how the practice of compassion in the way that I described it alters the brain's response to emotional events. And one of the ways we can probe that is by actually presenting sounds that represent emotional events while the practitioners are meditating in the scanner. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we present what we call the sounds of human suffering. So sounds of... Um, screams and wails, babies crying unconsolably. These are all nonverbal cues which are universally recognized as representing suffering. And um, compassion is, can be thought of as an emotional state uh, that involves the strong aspiration to relieve suffering, uh, to relieve suffering in others, as well as in oneself. Uh, and so one of the ways that we thought we can potentially examine how the brain, uh, when it is generating compassion, may influence the processing of information related to suffering is by uh, challenging the brain, if you will, uh, in this way and presenting these sounds of human suffering. And so. What we observed when we did that is something quite dramatic. The area of the brain that's circled in the brain image that you see, that's an, um, uh, a, what we call an axial image of the brain. So if you slice the brain going from the bottom to the top, uh, uh, just like that, uh, which we can do with the MRI scanner, uh, these are the kinds of images that you see. And the area that's circled is an area called the insula. Uh, I-N-S-U-L-A, insula. The insula is a really interesting part of the brain. 
Uh, and it's a really interesting part of the brain because it's the only part of the brain that has a map of the internal visceral organs. Uh, so it literally maps the body in the brain. And it is the linchpin in the communication between the mind and the body. It all goes through the insula, or at least a lot of it goes through the insula. The insula also has connections, descending connections, to different bodily locations, different visceral organs, and influences their activity. Now, um, what we see when the practitioners are generating compassion is a dramatic amplification of activity in this part of the brain, particularly in response to these sounds of human suffering. Uh, it's like the volume control is just jacked up uh, in a major way. Uh, and uh, we compare the long-term practitioners to age and gender matched um, controls who are interested in learning meditation. We actually teach them these practices, but they've only been meditating for a week when we do these tests, and uh, they don't show this at all. Um, so this is clearly something that seems to develop uh, as a consequence of, of practice. So uh, these findings suggest that the brain clearly is impacted by this kind of training, but one of the limitations of the studies that I've told you about so far is that I've only told you about these studies in these very long-term practitioners. And let's face it, these individuals have made choices to live a certain kind of life that I think is not a choice that any of us in this audience are likely to make. Um, we're not about to spend this amount of time in practice of this sort. So what can we learn about shorter periods of practice that are much more likely to be the kinds of practice that, 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 that uh, I might do or that you might do? Or is that, um, are those shorter periods of practice enough to influence the brain in ways that may be helpful? So um, we've explored that in a number of different domains, uh, both in terms of the effects of meditation, uh, uh, of compassion meditation of the sort that I described, which I'll tell you more about in a few moments, as well as exploring the effects uh, on other qualities which are also very, very important. And um, this slide is a reminder for me to uh, talk a little bit about attention. Attention is one of the six emotional styles that I describe in the book, The Emotional Life of Your Brain. We normally don't think of attention as a part of emotion, but when you think about it, we're often the, the things that we attend to, that our attention is pulled to in our environment, are typically emotional cues. Um, those are the things that, that orient our attention, uh, that distract us in many ways, um, but also things that are important that we want to attend to. Uh, attention also is a very basic building block for virtually all other forms of learning. There is a plethora of evidence to suggest that if we don't attend to what is in front of us, we're not going to learn it. Now, there is an amazing study which was published a few years ago in a very prestigious journal, the journal Science, um, by some friends and colleagues of mine at Harvard, some psychologists, uh, and um, they took advantage of the fact that these days lots of people have smartphones, and um, they did this study in a very large group of participants. Um, because they, they didn't, it was not a laboratory study, it was a study done out in the real world. And what they did is they um, texted people on their smartphones uh, and they asked them three simple questions. Uh, they knew that they were part of a study, obviously. They asked them three simple questions. One is um, they, uh, on a, they, they, a list came up and they had to pick 
an activity that was closest to what they're currently doing. Um, so they had to basically say what it is they're currently doing. The second is they had to say where their mind is right now, and specifically, are you attending to what you're doing or not? Now, how many of us have ever had the experience of reading a book where you read one page and then maybe even another page and you have no friggin' idea what you just read? How many have had that experience? Okay. Um, that is mind wandering. Um, that is when you are actually not, your mind is somewhere else. You are not paying attention to what you're doing. In this study, what was measured is what percentage of the average American um, adult life is spent attending to what they're actually doing. And here is what they found. They found that 47% of the time during our waking lives, 47% of the time, people are actually not paying attention to what they're doing. Their mind is wandering. 47% of the time. And there was a third question that they asked with each, when they were beeped. The third question was, on a sliding scale, just rate your mood from very happy to very unhappy. And what do you think they found? When people were not paying attention to what they were doing, they were mostly unhappy. Their, their mood was dysphoric. And the conclusion from that paper was that um, they said uh, that mind wandering was a, um, a, a cost that uh, we are stuck with um, because of the cognitive sophistication that um, we we're, we've been endowed with. Um, because of the nature of our brains, the fact that we have a big hunk of real estate in the front, which is called the prefrontal cortex, enables our mind to be in places other than what we're doing, uh, and that the cognitive achievement of the prefrontal cortex comes with the cost of um, having a propensity to mind wander. Now, uh, while this is a very interesting study, my own take on it is that this is the average American today, but this is not obligatory. This is not, this is not the default mode of our mind. It is not necessary. Now, people go to extreme lengths to decrease their mind wandering and to experience uh, something that has been popularized by Mike Chicksamahai, a psychologist who's now at um, Claremont College in California, who used to be at the University of Chicago, uh, called flow. How many of you have ever heard of the concept flow? Okay. Well, for those of you who might not, flow uh, simply is being in the groove. And it's the kind of state where you get in where uh, you uh, you have a certain challenge in your environment and your skill set is perfectly matched to that challenge and you are immersed in what you're doing and you're not thinking about anything else and you, you are not thinking about yourself. You're just totally into it. And flow is often reported by people doing extreme sports. And Chicksamahai studied people like rock climbers um, who uh, go to these extreme lengths and the thing about rock climbers is they put themselves, at least some do, in positions where if there is even a momentary lapse of attention, it could be lethal. So that is a situation where there is no mind wandering because if there was mind wandering, the consequences would be devastating. And they, the people report these states being extraordinarily blissful, really pleasant. What I'd like to invite you to consider is that we can be in flow 24-7. It doesn't require that we rock climb. It doesn't require that we do these extreme sports. We can actually train our minds so that we can be in a constant state of flow.
by paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally. And that is a definition of mindfulness, paying attention on purpose, non-judgmentally. That is a trainable skill, and it's a skill that can be cultivated through certain kinds of practice. So I want to give you one example of a hard-nosed research study that we did that shows this, that confirms this, where we took people who went through three months of training. So it's not like long-term practitioners. Um, and uh, we tested them on one aspect of attention which involves paying attention to very small changes in the environment. Um, and uh, we looked at a phenomenon called the attentional blink. And we can actually all have a little taste of this. So we're going to do a little experiment now. So I'd like you to all to please sit up straight. And just focus your attention on this crosshair. And I'm going to be showing you a series of letters and numbers. And I'd like you to simply pay attention to the numbers. Uh, and in your mind, just keep track of whatever numbers are presented. Did I present the number one? How many people? Two? Three? Four? Five? Six? Seven? Eight? Nine? Okay. Very good. You're a quite attentive group. It's good. Um, so this is... Uh, basically what I showed you. Uh, now, mind you that this is uh, not a laboratory apparatus. This is Microsoft PowerPoint running on a Mac. Uh, there are many limitations. We can't control the timing in the way we'd like here. Uh, but it gives you a feel for this. I presented a series of letters. And I, the first number that I presented was a 3. Virtually all of you saw the 3. Um, very soon after the three, I presented the seven. And I would say about two-thirds of you who saw the seven uh, seem to also see the three. But there are quite a few of you who did not see the seven. That is, who uh, saw the three but did not see the seven. And this is called the attentional blink. It's as if the mind goes blank. And it's as if you get so excited about seeing the three um, that you sort of space out uh, and that the mind goes blank. Now, it turns out that neuroscientists have um, studied this phenomenon a lot. And most neuroscientists believe that the attentional blink is kind of an obligatory refractory period of the nervous system. This is a period when the nervous system goes offline, so to speak. Uh, in our view, we, we showed this to some of the long-term practitioners, and they um, thought that uh, this really is something that would be affected by the kind of mindfulness practices that they do. And so what we did is a study where we actually tested participants before and after three months of training. So we have the meditation group on the left, and on the right is a series of age and gender match controls. And the light bars, time one, represents testing before three months of training. And time two, the dark bars, represent the um, results after three months of training. Uh, in the novices, the controls, there was no training during that period. They just did the tests um, uh, once and then three months later. And what you see is that before they start at time one, there are no differences between these two groups. And at time two, after the training, the practitioners are doing better. Uh, they're showing a, they are able to see the seven much more often. Of course, it's not always three and seven. We use different numbers. But they are performing better on this task. Uh, in the controls, there's a slight increase after three months, likely because they're doing the task again. It's a practice effect. Um, but they're not showing a significant enhancement of their performance. 
Uh, and we also see that there are changes that occur in the brain that, that um, are associated with these changes that we see in performance. Uh, and I won't, uh, I, I don't have a slide of that, so it's, um, but there, there are systematic changes that occur in the brain as well. Now, um, what time am I supposed to end, just so I? You had wanted to finish up at 5.30. Okay, good. So um, I want to, before I leave the topic of attention, I just want to uh, uh, say to you, to, to uh, provide one of my all-time favorite quotes in, in all of psychology. This is something that William James, uh, the great American, the first great American psychologist who um, worked at the, in the late 1800s. Um, he, in 1890, he wrote a two-volume tome called The Principles of Psychology. And in that book, he has a chapter on attention, uh, which is really an extraordinary chapter. And he says, in that chapter on attention, he said the following. The faculty of voluntarily bringing back a wandering attention over and over again is the very root of judgment, character, and will. An education which should improve this faculty would be the education par excellence. But it is easier to define this ideal than to give practical directions for bringing it about. That's a direct quote from William James. If William James had contact with these traditions, I think he would have instantaneously seen that these are vehicles for educating attention. And there are now quite a few serious scientific studies that have demonstrated that different aspects of attention can indeed be trained. So in the next few minutes, and then we'll end and have time for questions, uh, I want to just move on now to the topic, back to the topic of compassion and give you a feel for m more of the nature of th these kinds of practices uh, and, and do it in the context of a serious scientific study uh, that we've done in our lab that's just about to come out. Uh, it'll be out in the next few weeks, uh, done by a very talented graduate student in our group, Helen Wang. Um, so this is a study where we had people volunteer for a research project where they were told that they were going to be taught one of two methods to improve well-being. And they were randomly assigned after an initial assessment to one of two strategies. One is compassion meditation, which I'll say more about in a minute. And the other comes from cognitive therapy, which is probably the most well-validated, empirically well-validated psychological treatment for anxiety and mood disorders, and also to enhance well-being. Um, so uh, what we did is we had participants sign up, and this was for just two weeks of training, where participants practiced for 30 minutes a day for two weeks, and that's it. Um, and uh, uh, they, were, they practiced either compassion meditation or uh, cognitive reappraisal. Uh, and we actually delivered the, um, we delivered the practice over the internet, uh, which has advantages and disadvantages, but they logged onto a protected website and actually went through a guided practice, which enabled us to monitor exactly how much they were doing. So they did this for 30 minutes a day for two weeks. So it's a total of seven hours of practice. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this kind of compassion training. Participants were asked to contemplate and visualize the suffering and then wishing the freedom from that suffering for different categories of people. And we first began with a loved one where they were asked to Think of a person very close to them, a family member. Could be a spouse. It could be a child, uh, a very, very close friend. Someone who clearly uh, is part of a 
a group of loved ones and imagine a time in their life when they were suffering and then cultivate this strong aspiration that they be relieved of that suffering. So we start with the loved one. We then have them move on to themselves. <clears throat> Do the same thing. Imagine a time in your own life when you were feeling uh, bad, when you were suffering, and cultivate the aspiration that you be relieved of that suffering. <clears throat> we then had them move on to a stranger. Now, a stranger in this context was meant to be something very specific, a person whose face you recognize. <clears throat> it could be someone who, you, who works in the same office building as you, but you may not know very much about their life. And, <clears throat> or it could be uh, someone you see in a grocery store, a cashier, any person who you recognize, um, but who you know very little about. Envision that person, visualize their face, and imagine a time in their life when they may have been suffering and then go through the same aspiration. We then have you move on to a difficult person, someone who really pushes your buttons, someone who makes you angry. Bring that person into your mind and heart and go through the same procedure. Cultivate the strong aspiration <clears throat> that they be relieved of suffering. And then we have them move on to as many beings as possible. It could be human beings, it could be animals, um, any beings, uh, as many as you can imagine in this circle. We have participants use a phrase or two that they silently repeat to themselves. A phrase such as, may you be free from suffering, may you experience joy and ease. And participants are instructed to notice whatever visceral sensations may occur in their body as they do this. And finally, they're instructed to feel the compassion emotionally and not to simply repeat these phrases cognitively. And uh, I won't go through all these details. I'm actually going to, pardon me, I'll skip this slide. And um, one of the things that we do is to measure the behavioral changes induced by compassion meditation is we give people economic decision-making tasks that allow us to actually get behavioral measures of altruism. And uh, this will take us far afield if I describe this in detail. I'd be happy to answer questions about it. But what we see is that after just two weeks of training, people actually behave more altruistically in tasks where there are real financial consequences. Um, and that's what's displayed here. The compassion group is showing more altruistic behavior, more pro-social behavior than the reappraisal group. And there are all kinds of changes in the brain that we see. We put them in the MRI scanner before and after the two weeks of training. This is just after seven hours of training. And so seven hours is sufficient to produce robust, measurable changes in the brain. So although we work with very long-term practitioners, uh, we know from this study as well as others that even seven hours of training is enough to change the brain in ways that promote um, pro-social and compassionate behavior. Now, this is a slide to just remind me to say that I've been brain-centric up until now but it turns out that the brain, as I mentioned, with the insula is connected to the body. And this, these kinds of practices don't just affect the brain. They also affect the body. This is data from a study that we did a number of years ago with complete novices. We trained them for two months, one class a week for two months in mindfulness meditation. We then gave them an influenza vaccine and we looked at antibody titers mounted in response to the vaccine. After two months of training, this is in a randomized controlled trial, the individuals assigned to the meditation group are actually showing enhanced immune responses. They're showing an enhanced antibody response to the influenza vaccine. And it, the, the findings suggest that if these two groups were exposed to the same level of flu virus, the meditators would be more protected. Okay, 
I'm going to end now with one last thing. And um, one of the things that we know from modern neuroscience is that the brain is plastic throughout life. Uh, so that's the good news. Um, the other good news is that it's even more plastic early in life. Um, there are sensitive periods in development where the brain is especially plastic. Our brains are constantly being influenced, wittingly or unwittingly, mostly unwittingly. And the invitation in this whole talk is that we can all take more responsibility for our own brains. We can actually influence the nature of our neuroplasticity by shaping our brains in more positive ways. And we thought that if we can start with really young kids, preschool children, maybe we can cultivate healthy habits of mind that then influence kids and promote a more positive trajectory from very early on. So when we first asked the Dalai Lama about this, I asked him if he had any recommendations for how we should start, and he just burst out laughing, and he said, I've never had children, so uh, I have absolutely no idea. Uh, but he encouraged us to investigate this scientifically. So we have developed a curriculum that we call the Kindness Curriculum. I'm not going to read through this. You can go in on our website and learn more about it. These are some of the topics covered. It's an eight-week curriculum that involves 90 minutes a week in the classroom in preschools. Um, we've done research uh, uh, with um, preschools on campus, lab preschools, to, to pilot this. We're now working in the Madison public school system with this year about 200 kids in the 4K program, which is the preschool uh, in our public schools, implementing the kindness curriculum. We're randomizing the children by classroom, and we're doing this rigorously in the context of randomized controlled research and looking at the impact of this curriculum. In our early work, teachers report that kids who go through this intervention are behaving more cooperatively and more pro-socially in the classroom. Um, we have a measure of attention uh, where kids are asked to press a button to indicate the direction that the fish is pointing. Is it pointing to the left or to the right? And there are some trials where the fish on the sides, the flankers, are distracting, as it is in this trial. Kids make mistakes, uh, as well as adults. Uh, when there are these distractors. And what we found is that, this is a little hard to see, but after uh, eight weeks of training, kids behave um, better on this task. They are both more accurate and they are faster than a group of control kids who get a standard curriculum. And finally, we developed a task that we call the other sharing task. We learn which child in each classroom is the kids <coughs> best friend, which child is the kid's least favorite friend, least favorite person. We also have a, and we get pictures of these two children, we get pictures of a third child that we call the stranger child, uh, a picture of a child that the, our subject has never seen before, and a fourth child was an obviously sick looking child, which is the child in the, in the right. And we put these photographs on envelopes. And we give the kids a bunch of stickers, and we say, please distribute the stickers according to who you'd like to give them to. Do you want to give them to your best friend, your least favorite person, and so forth? And before they go through this intervention, um, the blue bar, the big blue bar, is their best friend. They give most of the stickers to their best friend, and they distribute the others equally among these, these three groups. After eight weeks of the kindness curriculum, this is what happens. They distribute the stickers equitably across these four categories. Now, this is only stickers, but remember, these are four- and five-year-olds. Uh, and uh, it correlates with uh, other measures of pro-social behavior that we obtain. So um, I want to end uh, 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 by just um, reminding you that this work is being done at the Center for Investigating Healthy Minds at the Waisman Center. And you can learn more by going to our website, investigatinghealthyminds.org. These are many of the people who have contributed to this work. And I want to end with um, one of my favorite quotes. This is uh, actually um, something that Albert Einstein wrote 
in a letter to a friend who was asking for some advice. Uh, he was having difficulty with his daughter. This was written in 1921. Einstein said, a human being is part of a whole, called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings, as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Thank you very much.